I would like to make a presentation, even if it's sort of an intimate setting and we have all already talked to each other. Uh, not me. <laughs> not, not Anna, not yet. Uh, but we from Sassnet would like to welcome Asha Kota and Benothi. What's it? Then worry uh, to come here to Lund to give a presentation about your work in India uh, for Dalit women and um, your struggle to uh, end impunity around the issue of uh, sexual harassment uh, towards Dalit women. And you will talk more about uh, how you have performed this work, uh, I suspect, during the last year, uh, and also about the big march that you arranged uh, early, earlier this year, uh, in the beginning of 2014. So, uh, very much uh, welcome to you two. And before we give the word to you, uh, Anna would like to say something about Sasquatch as well. Uh, my name is Anna Greenberg and I work for Sasquatch as Linda Dutt. And uh, we are a few more people there. You will see them here in the back of this brochure. Uh, Lars Eklund and also Lugna, who is there. And um, SASNET, the Swedish South Asian Studies Network at Lund University, is an organization um, that has existed for 14 years now. At the beginning, we were financed uh, by SIDA, the Swedish International Development um, Agency, but now Lund University uh, is financing our, our network. Um, and uh, what do we do? Well, we try to um, uh, promote education and research about South Asia um, the best we can. <laughs> and we uh, also try to, um, uh, well, we have a, a monthly newsletter uh, with lots of information about uh, conferences, workshops, seminars, mainly in um, seminars and uh, mainly in Sweden, but conference and uh, other things also more or less all over the world. And um, so, we um, um, welcome you very much here uh, today, and it's a pleasure to have you here. And uh, we also um, will film you. I hope that you don't mind, but it's good for our record, so we will never forget you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe we can just... Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yes, oh. we do. And uh, thank you first of all to Sasnet, particularly uh, Linda who has been writing to us and you know uh, coordinating uh, with us for uh, having this uh, discussion here and we're really happy uh, to be uh, here at, um, at Lund University and we feel so warmly welcomed uh, with uh, hospitality. Uh, as, um, as Linda has already mentioned that uh, we both, uh, Tinmori and myself, are uh, two uh, Dalit women activists uh, uh, representing a much larger movement uh, of Dalit women leaders, uh, community leaders uh, back home uh, in India. Uh, so basically what we have for you today, this evening is, uh, uh, since it's also a small intimate uh, group, uh, we can have a good discussion on this. Uh, to really understand this whole uh, structure of caste, uh, the way in which uh, the caste hegemony has operated for way too long now, and uh, uh, in, in that structure uh, and in that uh, uh, control um, of economic, social and political power, uh, where does it place us Dalit women who fall under the intersections of both caste and uh, patriarchy? And uh, in particular, uh, what uh, uh, the different forms and patterns of violence we have been uh, facing. And uh, uh, not just about the situation, we'll, we'll definitely talk about the situation, but we also want to present to you uh, about the uh, assertions of Dalit women and Dalits in India, uh, the kind of articulations that are for, uh, forming and uh, the collective strength of the community, especially through this process of the self-respect uh, march, which we both were a part of with so many other Dalit women activists. Uh, and then probably at the end, we can also uh, have a discussion as to how we can take this uh, small discussion forward 
in terms of greater solidarity and in terms of being involved, uh, ways to be involved in, in this uh, campaign at various levels. Uh, to do this, uh, we have we both want to speak a little bit and share some of our experiences and our own understanding and analysis and also uh, complement it with some of the you know, films, film clips uh, which uh, Tenmori has uh, been working on also a part of the documentation of this whole uh, freedom uh, march that we have been involved with. So that's what we have planned for the next um, hour or so and then we can keep some time for um, discussion. So uh, you want to start yeah. with that first slide, uh, first uh, the um, trailer? Yeah. So this clip was aimed to kind of just introduce and help us open up the conversation about the past Right there. Me too. Um, yeah. um, about caste-based sexual violence. So we'll watch the film and then we'll discuss it a little bit. And we have public events like this is that it's really part of the process of all of us breaking the silence about this issue and learning better how to talk about it, learning better how to grapple with something that's as heinous and as terrible on the scope of this issue, and also um, better to understand how we can work together to change it. You know, So some of what we like to do before we get into the process of the campaign is to just make sure that we have a shared definition of all the terms that we're using. Because I think sometimes when you are um, abroad and you start to talk about caste, you already lose 50% of the people because <laughs> they're like, what? <laughs> so um, part of our process here is to kind of give, give you guys tools around that. So um, in the campaign, when we've been talking about caste, we're talking about a system of oppression um, that is over 2,000 years old, that, that weaves race, class, and faith into an insidious noose that, that traps over 200 million people in India alone. It's a larger number when you take in the other countries of the subcontinent. Um, but what's critical to kind of think about and why it's, it's boggling that this is not an issue that's not on the newspaper every day is that when you think about the last major solidarity movement, the anti-apartheid movement, um, the population of South Africa was 50 million, right? And when we're talking about Dalits, we're talking about four to five South African South Africans. So this population, Dalits, the two that we're here representing, um, uh, really struggle with this system. But caste is not just a system that affects us, it affects all of us. Because the way that it interacts and creates Indian culture, um, it's there in every single institution. It determines the friends you're going to meet, it determines the kinds of marriages you have, where you live, what resources you're, you can access, your outcomes in school. It determines everything. Because like every system of oppression, it has institutional, interpersonal, and internal manifestations. So a lot of times, like you were talking about, when you talk to Indians abroad, they'll either deny that caste exists, or they'll say, well, I, I don't know it because it's not like me and my friends talk about caste or do these things. Um, that may be their interpersonal experience, but the structural reality and the data says that caste you know, discrimination is alive and well, whether it's at a policy level or in the issue that we're going to talk about in the culture of impunity that exists around caste-based sexual violence. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to, um, uh, I think that one thing that's really important, and just to, you know, because not everybody in the room may be familiar, um, the caste system was set up with the idea that society was broken up into these four castes, the Brahmins who were the priests, the Kshatriyas who were the warriors, the Vaishyas who were the merchants and the landowners, and the Shudras who were kind of like the commoners. But those of us who are untouchable, are actually outside of the caste system. We're at the bottom, and we were considered outcast and polluting, like spiritually polluting to the touch because, um, because of our professions. And, uh, and, and part of being Dalit, which is a political identity, is about releasing that epithet, being untouchable, and taking on a name that, that is of our struggle. So I think that one of the things that's important, especially when you're talking to other Desis who deny caste and want to, and, and are, don't have clarity about like, well, what's actually happening with the manifestation of caste in terms of Indian structures, I think we look at the reversal of the pyramid. So while there may be, while Dalits and those at the bottom are the greater amount of the population, the concentration of who gets to define knowledge, who gets to hoard resources, 
who gets to collect capital and who owns most of the land is at the top. So part of our conversation, again, about breaking the silence is about looking at the inequities that come out of the caste system and how structurally that makes India vulnerable in, in the terms of it being so unbalanced. Um, so Asha, if you want to take it away in terms of sexual violence. Yes, um, I will do that. But I was just, um, as we were watching and uh, uh, Mori was presenting, I was looking at this brochure of, of Sassner and about uh, how this is uh, looking at the South Asian uh, Studies Network and this particular map that we have uh, over here in, in, in your uh, brochure. I think uh, what we're speaking uh, about today is not just about India at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I think uh, this, this, this needs to be known that because it's not an internal domestic matter of India. Uh, alone. This is an issue that affects uh, a lot of uh, Dalits living in the neighboring countries and also the Dalits who have moved out and in, in, in the diaspora in different uh, communities. And also I think it was uh, what came to my mind was it's so important that we are having this conversation here because it is uh, these uh, uh, kind of networks uh, and associations uh, of uh, Indians and South Asians across the world that have actually may have been a major part of this denial of caste and caste-based discrimination. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's here in Sweden or whether it's in, in the United States or anywhere else, the pyramid that we just saw here, the inverted pyramid, and one of the, one of the uh, first, first points was actually on knowledge, knowledge and resources and uh, capital and uh, land, which is all uh, actually um, completely appropriated by the tip of this triangle belonging to the uh, uh, most of the dominant and uh, upper caste uh, community. It is this, it is the, that section of people who are actually controlling everything, including the knowledge, and that's why including the academic, academic circles, including the uh, media, the policy makers and everything else. And that's why it has been possible that uh, India is being projected as this country of uh, Bollywood or, uh, 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 you know, yoga, yeah. IT, yeah. and, uh, you know, all these flashy things about uh, India uh, without talking about this cancer of caste uh, and uh, uh, horrific exploitation and oppression that happens every single day. Now, how is that possible? How, how can this kind of a, uh, such kind of a large uh, scale denial uh, happen. It precisely happens because like what Swati was saying that if you talk to anyone if, uh, outside here in Sweden also they'll say oh no 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 this was all there in the past and now there's nothing uh, something like this or it may exist in some remote village and it, it's not there uh, anymore. But I think that is the myth that needs to be broken and these conversations are extremely uh, important uh, uh, for that particular purpose. This is also uh, very important because we are talking about women's rights and gender rights. All of us who believe in, in gender justice and who believe in uh, rights for uh, women uh, need to understand these intersections of caste and patriarchy. Because like, if the woman at the bottom, and in this case the bottom of this hierarchy being Dalit women, indigenous women, if these women, we are not free, then no other woman is free actually because there's no there's no question of gender justice if women continue to be oppressed by these other structures, particularly that of uh, caste. I think that is something that also conversations like this are challenging and uh, actually bringing this out into the, into the fore. Talking particularly about Dalit women, we have seen how uh, the structure of caste is operating. These five. Um, uh, uh, categories that you see, they are not five categories, there are like 3,000 castes in, in, this, in this line and I think the beauty of this system is so is such that the way in which the its society is stratified and in, in that hierarchy placing one above the other, one above the other, so this kind of discrimination is possible at all levels. Now in this, in this structure when you place the women there are women on top, there are women at the bottom, there are women who are outside this structure also. So that clearly indicates that all women are not equal. 
women at the bottom, they are facing a completely different set of challenges than uh, women perhaps on, on, at the top of this uh, hierarchy. Uh, I'm a social activist, I'm a Dalit women activist, and very often I, I say so many things and um, uh, it can it can also be seen that oh she's an activist and she's saying all of all all these you know all these stories about India all these you know so she's describing a situation in India, but actually more than more than what I am saying I would encourage everyone to look at the available data, data not NGO data or not my campaign data but actually the government data. There is ample uh, evidence uh, available, there is no dearth of data available to show this uh, huge disparity that exists in any human development indicator that you take, be it education, access to health, access to education, access to land, uh, freedom to choose your partner, or any anything, any, any, anything you take and then when you look at it from this lens, the picture is going to be completely, completely different. Now, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, 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 sexual violence and violence against women particularly in the past, in the recent past uh, two years. And everyone has this thing that, okay, uh, violence against women is there, it's not, it's not specific to India, neither is it specific to the South, South Asian region. Violence against women and discrimination exists ac across the globe. Now, what is it that makes it different for um, Dalit women? What is it that makes this violence uh, different uh, when it comes to the lowest caste or the untouchable women. To understand that, I think we need to first understand the uh, perpetrators of these crimes. When we look at Dalit women, the perpetrators of these crimes against Dalit women are usually uh, upper caste men or groups of upper caste men or uh, groups of men from belonging to different castes. Okay, and also men from their own, their own community and the perpetrators also include women from the dominant communities. We, a lot of uh, cases we have seen where there is a, group, a mob violence or a, you know, a caste violence in, in the village. It is the women from the upper caste or who are also, uh, uh, what do you say, party to those crimes against uh, Dalit women discrimination, verbal abuse, uh, and different forms of violence, we have seen that even women are, uh, 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 you know, exploiting the, uh, to, uh, the Dalit women. I think that is something which is very important to recognize. Secondly, if you look at the patterns of violence, when we look at the, the patterns of violence on Dalit women, we see that most of the acts of violence on the Dalit women are public acts of humiliation. It is always meant to humiliate her and then attack her. So you see that the the violence has happened like in the in the in the in the village outside, you know, in the in the in the main center of the village. That's where she's maybe for, uh, uh, stripped naked or made to parade naked in the village, or you know, they, uh, shave her head or pull out her nails or you know those kind of brutal acts of violence are always done in, in, in a public space in, uh, to humiliate her and her caste identity. And uh, it's not, uh, this, these uh, acts of violence against her cannot be seen as an individual case where one man or, one, uh, or a group of men have decided to uh, you know, uh, abuse her. It's a much deeper structural violence that is uh, aimed at uh, Dalit women. To understand that we need to see this whole uh, situation of reprisal violence or a sort of a revenge violence. We have seen and it is so clear that so many cases of violence that we have been following up where the community is moving forward, no? uh, getting education or you know, uh, getting uh, small land or getting some kind of socio-economic political forward uh, mobility, there we see that there is a huge uh, uh, backlash violence on her uh, to push her and push her whole community uh, back. So we've seen where we take few steps forward, we have pushed, you know, 10 steps uh, backward. And in, in, that, in that scenario, it is the bodies of Dalit women that are, that become like the battleground of caste. The bodies of Dalit women again and again used to reinforce this caste power or this caste hegemony. Uh, it, it, it seems that you know 
from the experience of handling these cases, it seems that uh, the way in which a Dalit woman is viewed, like it's clear, clearly seen that you know, Kishi, you all belong to a lower caste, and so you will have like a lower character or a, like a lower morality uh, person, and that's why your body is available for my use. No, I can use you as 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 a property because you are a low caste, so you are low character, low morals, and so uh, you, I can use uh, 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 your body in the way that uh, that I please to do because it's it's like my property. So that is the, that you this kind of a mindset which is actually any bigger situation the the conflict may be to do with land, the conflict may be to do with some kind of a political conflict or some other issue that's happening there in the village. But it is finally the situation is painted on the character of this woman and the lower loose morals and, and hence available uh, for my use to attack you and to use you the way I please and just dispose you of. So it is this caste mindset along with the intersections of uh, gender and, and patriarchy uh, that forms this kind of a web and also most of the women who we are actually talking to, uh, talking to you today are the ones who are living at the lowest poverty uh, levels with very low income. So when this whole situation of poverty and here caste structure and here patriarchy, within this whole complex web is actually the Dalit woman. And I think um, what uh, the, the kind of situation and the challenges that she faces is so complex, uh, complex, uh, complex because she has to deal with uh, everything from her survival to actually her life and her uh, dignity for herself and for her uh, uh, entire uh, family but what it is uh, what these are the just the patterns the kind of you know mindsets and all that which operate which are diff which are very different for Dalit women but really what happens after that incident of violence is a whole another uh, uh, story of the con uh, total uh, failure of the implementation of the law, the total failure of complete breakdown of all these institutions that are mandated really to provide her justice. And I think that process sometimes is uh, is a process which is again like re-victimizing this woman uh, survivor or this victim and her family who is actually trying to seek uh, for justice. That is what we have observed in, in dealing with, we have been working on these cases for so long now and like just documenting the cases, being with the victims, the families, trying to follow up the case, the legal follow up, etc, etc. But every step these kind of uh, challenges uh, we are facing and that was one of the reasons why we decided to go ahead and do this kind of a long, uh, a long struggle where we actually marched across the four uh, different states which we will be coming to uh, later on. But I think uh, it's really crucial that you know, st uh, like uh, uh, South, like study social studies network, no, South Asian studies network, uh, like this, uh, and also women's rights and feminist uh, organizations and bodies, uh, um, and um, all other human rights activists and those who believe in social justice. It's very very critical to understand this intersectionality framework. Sometimes this intersectionality framework, to my mind, is used very uh, loosely. Also, that you know, okay, all intersections, it's it's there. But I think it's so important for us to open and open each and each layer. There are so many layers operating at at, at the same time, and I think uh, you know, peeling those layers. Even for us, every day we are learning new uh, new uh, layers uh, uh, that uh, that exist. And I, th I think that all of us, uh, especially those like us young students and, and those involved in the academic world, really need to put our heads together in, in terms of understanding this very clearly. Because if we don't understand it, then we don't know how to deal with it. And it's so crucial and so critical that this needs to come to an end. Because, I mean, it's just absolutely uh, bizarre that in this day and age when, you know, we're projected to be such a very... Uh, flashy and shiny country but how can this how can this kind of a situation still uh, continue so I will stop right now because we want to uh, talk a little bit more about the uh, the, the kind of the institutional uh, uh, failures 
and uh, the kind of impunity that uh, uh, that exists, impunity at all levels, starting from the village at the police station level up to UN in UN uh, Human Rights Council and uh, in other international uh, uh, diplomatic engagements. I think that chain of impunity and denial is something uh, uh, which is. Uh, Reinforced again and again by you know by media, by uh, the academia, and by the, all the diplomatic high-level discussions that no one wants to talk about this. So uh, that is something very crucial to understand, and I think that will also be uh, that will also form a basis of our future uh, solidarity work that we can work uh, together with. But I think I'll ask then Mori now to. Um, take over and also talk a little bit about the yatra and stuff. Great. And also if you, if any time you want to ask any question you can just stop and we're all because it's the just a conversation. So <laughs> it's not really a lecture. Yeah. Off you go for yeah. okay. um, so this next clip will will start us off in terms of the conversation about the yatra itself and from there we'll go into our strategies and how to take on this culture of impunity. I just have actually I have um, um, I'm thinking of maybe if people that see this clip afterwards um, um, that don't know caste that, that well and are wondering about the links between um, caste and class. Maybe not link, but I mean, some of the sure. scenarios that you share uh, that are caste based, uh, we could see similarities uh, that are class based. Uh, for some here in, in Sweden. Sure. I mean, I think that what we can do is um, we can talk about, it's almost like a Venn diagram where mm. caste and class and gender, right? And there's places where you, they intersect, where the, the poorest of the poor are Dalit and Adivasi and Bahujan women, you know? Um, but not all Dalits are poor, although the majority of Dalits are poor. Mm. And not all the poor are Dalits, but the majority of the poor are Dalits. Mm. So. Um, and, and, and that's all kind of like relayed back in terms of um, government data. Um, but I think what's interesting about the way class operates in Europe is, is that there is an aspect to class here that's also very generational because of the way that um, families that have had power and have had money have maintained that over generationally, as opposed to like some other structures where uh, some other countries that are newer and the, the class structure is a little bit more porous, you know. But I, I say that with like question, you know, with, with air quotations. But also, um, uh, specifically thinking when you're saying that the oppression is uh, done through the bodies of uh, Dalit women, yeah. that we can see the same thing in a class structure. That the oh, oppression okay. is yes, within yes. the bodies of. Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay, so we'll watch this clip and then we'll talk about it. Um, Man Yatra Ai Hai Harinyana Me Swabhiman Yatra Ai Hai Harinyana Me Jodabhi Jokuchli 